second epistle of John. I'm going to read the whole chapter. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, and we love that we love one another. And this is the love, sorry, and this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you that bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. The focus I am going to grab hold of from this passage is in verse 6 where it says, As ye have heard, ye should walk. As ye have heard, ye should walk. I got those two phrases underlined in my, in my Bible. I'm removing from the Bible here, but just simply grabbing hold of those very specific ideas and not grabbing it out of context even. John here is exhorting that as ye have heard, ye should walk. And he said this many a times in the previous general epistle which went out to all. And second epistle of John here is no different. Here we find the elder, in verse 1 we're looking at, the elder writing unto the elect lady and her children. Now the elder we know is John, and he is the leader within a church, within the church, whatsoever it may be. He is the elder by title writing unto the elect lady and her children. Now these terms that you see, are like elect, and like, and her children, right? We also often talk about the saved being children unto them. I think it all draws attention to the fact that this perhaps, given that an elder is writing to the elect here, is signifying that he is writing unto a church body here. Now, this elder is writing to this church and his church, mind you, because you see down in verse 13 where it says, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. So there's another body of elect that is greeting this elect lady along with the elder. What I believe is happening here, perhaps, is that this is an elder and his church writing the letter unto an elect lady or unto another church that may not necessarily have that elder ordained and ready yet. Confused? No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> the elder then is John and his church that he's writing to it seems he does have care over it in a certain capacity but rather he is separate from that and we'll see more as we go on now I may be speculating here practically speaking the Bible is simply explaining that there is a group of believers the elect that are receiving this letter and that is the main context of it uh, what that elect lady, who that elect lady is, whether it's a person or a body, we don't exactly know. But like I said, I'm just sort of speculating that the elect lady is a church and that the children are those believers within the church. Um, elect, let's grab a hold of that word. Elect isn't always necessarily, and if you'll turn to Romans chapter 11 quickly, keep your finger in the second epistle of John. 
<clears throat> Romans chapter 11, as many Baptists will say today, and as many, um, I guess the Reformed group would say, and many uh, other groups, I mean, this, this idea of Zionism is just creeping into every shape, form, and type of Christianity that you find there. They will say that the elect is always the Jews, or it's the Israel after the flesh, as we would call them, uh, based on our understanding and our interpretation. Romans chapter 11 and verse 7, though, divides these two. It makes it very clear that Israel is not the elect. What then, verse 7? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So we see then that the Israel being discussed here is not that the one that has obtained, but rather the election or the elect or the chosen hath obtained it, and the rest of that group was blinded in the process. And so, yes, a group of Israel was elect according to the foreknowledge of God. He called out, but we see a, a big distinguishing, a big separation happening here when you see both in the same context. Israel hath not obtained, the election hath obtained. So how can they be of the same group? 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 Thessalonians 1, if you would turn there, continues in this vein, 1 Thessalonians in chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2. We give thanks to God, making mention, or we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience and hope, and look at this, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Remember, this is written to a Thessalonian church, primarily Gentile believers. Verse 4 says, Knowing... Brethren, beloved, your election of God. So this group is of the election that he's writing to. Again, Thessalonian Gentile believers. For our gospel came. We know there's only one gospel. Not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Right? We're assured of our salvation when we hear that gospel. As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of who? The Lord, having received the word in much affliction and joy of the Holy Ghost, that you were examples to all them that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So again, the, these terms grabbing hold of the idea of verse 4 that the election of God is who is being written unto. He said, beloved, he says, brethren, you're the election of God, you have obtained that. And how do you do it? Well, they're in the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel came. They have assurance. They have assurance. They receive that same word. And though, so again, we have a practical context, even within the introduction of the book to the Thessalonians, that first book there, where he assures us that the election is a group that has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, received the gospel and the assurance that comes with it, and he has received the word of God. Therefore, completely separating from the fact that this elect terminology can be applied to the Jewish unbeliever of today. No, those are Israel according to the flesh. We know that Israel, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. We know that Israel as a whole is the body of believers. And so we can apply Every word, every line, every promise of the book, it's mine. Amen. Whether it's written to Jews or Greeks or whatsoever. Because in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. Continue back to 2nd Epistle of John. 2nd Epistle of John. And you'll find the truth in us. So he is writing in the truth because they have known the truth. And verse 2 says, For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. And this same assurance of the truth comes by the hand of Jesus Christ. And all of his benefits are then applied to us. And I love this because we have the truth within us. We have the truth with us. And therefore, what, what can possibly fail us or destroy us or carry us or drag us down within this world? That we have the truth and we have all of his benefits at our disposal. Again, this is just giving assurance to the fact that the truth is on our side. If the truth that we know and believe is according to the scriptures. 
His benefits, and I, I love to think about this, the fact that the best benefits package doesn't come from the great job you have. It doesn't come from the union that fought for it. The greatest benefits package comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and from being in Christ and having Christ with you. Psalm 68 verse 19 says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. His benefits plan is every day. It's available to us always because he is the God of our salvation. Selah. Pause and think and meditate upon that for a moment. It's in Psalm 68 if you want to look it up later. Verse 3 says this, Grace be with you. Just one of the many benefits that we have the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ with us. How about this? Mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this, just in case there's any doubt of who Jesus Christ was. For all those that would deny the sonship of God the Father, or the sonship, sorry, of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says this, the Son of the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. And those are the benefits that Jesus Christ extends unto us by way of the Father through his ministry upon earth. Grace, mercy, peace, truth, and love. If you have those, what, what lack you in this world? That's right. Amen. Verse 4, I greatly, I rejoiced. So I'm going to get into the actual topic here. So this was mostly the inner introduction as John greets, again, the elder, or, uh, the elder that greets the elect lady. This is kind of his introduction as, as he quite often writes in the similar fashion of, of Paul or Peter. They greet in the letter. Exhortation to walk what's being taught. So I didn't mention though, but the title of this is, As ye have heard, ye should walk. And that's just what I grabbed out of verse 6 there. And it's a truth that we've heard throughout this. Exhortation then, in verse 4 through 6, to walk what's already been taught. In verse 4, you see that I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. So the elder then is looking upon the elect lady and her children and rejoicing to find them that, that they are walking in that truth. The same truth that was received by means of commandment from the Father. He's rejoicing. He's overjoyed. And in the same way, when I preach a, a sermon, when I preach a thought, when I preach an idea here, and I find people within this congregation, children of God within this congregation, walking in those same truths as they have received commandment, not from Josh, but of the Father, I rejoice greatly in the same way, knowing that the Word of God has been set forth in such a way that it did something in someone's heart. And here, the beloved John, his heart is rejoicing greatly, finding that the truth is being acted out, the truth is being practiced by these believers at such a time. Verse 5 says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And again, that's always the push. It seems to be the uh, proverbial, you know, heartbeat of John the Apostle's ministry. He's always enforcing that heartbeat of love towards his congregation. He wants them to love one another. And he sees that love extended from one another as, that, as, as an active agent or a reaction to the same commandment that came from the beginning. He's not rewriting the book here. He's simply preaching that same truth that came all the way back in Genesis and runs through the whole scriptures that there should be a love one towards another. Even as the Father loved, we also ought to love. And he is giving commandment and pointing back again to the same things that he wrote even in that first epistle maybe. Or maybe even the same things that he wrote in that gospel message when he described Jesus Christ and use that message to lead people unto the Lord. The overarching, the overbearing truth that he always seems to want to go back to is love one for another. And that's his commandment. And that's his exhortation through all, all this. It's not something new. He's exhorting you to walk in what you've already been taught. Verse 6 says, And this is love, that we walk after his commandments, this is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And that same commandment is that same love. It's that same heartbeat of God then 
through the vehicle of the human frame, extending his same love to other people in this earth. And that's the believer's ministry, and that's what John is constantly trying to enforce. The same apostle that leaned upon Jesus' bosom and heard the heartbeat of God is now encouraging believers everywhere to hear that same heartbeat of God. And that heartbeat of God is to be acted upon other believers in the extension of God's love through them upon them. The exhortation to walk, what's already been taught. Verse 7 says this, and this is the exhortation to walk and not be deceived. Verse 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And the first time you read this, I think you start to wonder how, how to make this sudden turn. He's, he's saying you got to love one another. This is a command, you got to love one another. you got to love one another. For many deceivers have entered into Right? He, he, he makes this quick change. And you know what I think the reason why he makes this quick change? Is because he always seems to reinforce the idea of loving one another with the idea of the fact that you should not be deceived. And, and why would this be? Well, we all know the story of the bleeding heart. The person that always hears somebody's story and feels bad for them and extends their love, extends their finances, extends their health, their whatever, and ends up getting, you know, drugged through the mud over it, right? The people that love the most, even as the Apostle Paul says, the more I love, the less I be loved. The people that have the biggest love for other people are the people that get abused, get knocked down, get beaten. Think of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who loved more than Jesus Christ to give of his own, his own self to save the whole world, even those that hate him. And he was defamed, he was beaten, he was brutalized, he was, he was all but massacred, enough life left in him that he could nail, be nailed to a cross and hang there and die for the sins of the whole world. What love the Father hath bestowed upon us that he would send his Son to do such a thing for us. But many deceivers are entered into the world. He's, he's contrasting the fact that, yes, I want you to love, but you need to be watchful. You need to watch these things and not be deceived. In 1 John chapter 4, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. That same exhortation carries through all the writings of John where he's saying, you gotta love one another, you gotta love one another, you gotta love one another. And this is how men will know that you've loved the Father is your love one for another. And this is how your, your, your life in in Christ, your eternal life will be acted out is when you love one another. And he says, many deceivers are entered in the world. There's that spirit of antichrist. Be watchful of those things. And we talked about this also when we went through chapter 2 when we learned about knowing antichrist in contrast to knowing Christ. John is always careful when he's preaching love, love, love to say be watchful. Don't be deceived. Be wise unto these things. And why does he do that? Because we all know of the church that just love, 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 love. And it goes liberal and it falls off. And the first place that it always starts to bend when it's just exhibiting love to all groups and just loving and loving and loving without having righteous judgment, right? Because God is a God of love, but he's also a God of righteous judgment and indignation towards falsehoods. But when we're just love, 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 which you can get that sense when you read John, when you read how he writes about the heartbeat of God that's love towards another, he's wise enough to know that he needs to balance that out and say, hey, love and judge and love and judge. Be watchful of these things because we don't want you to be deceived. Seek truth, yes. Seek love one for another, but watch for error. And this is a common theme. When we get into this idea that our ministry is just all about loving, we are most likely to be deceived in these things. And this is why he, he brings it up. Many deceivers are entered in the world. He says this in verse 8. He says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Look to yourself. How do you look to yourself? Well, you look to yourself in a mirror. That's the only way you're ever going to see your own face is through a reflection. He says, look to yourself. See that reflection. Who are you? What are you? Focus on yourselves for a little while. Don't lose those things which you have wrought. And the best way that we can 
focus on ourselves isn't to look in the mirror. It's to look in the mirror of God's Word. God's Word will tell you everything you need to know about yourself. When I first got saved, that was one of the primary things that, that drew me unto the Bible and drew me unto, unto the Scriptures was that it spoke so truly and definitely about the world out there, but it also spoke so truly and definitely about the world in here, about who Josh was and what he was. I started to realize... I'm not as awesome as I think I am. The things that I are, are sin, according to the Bible, I would have never thought that that was sin. I need to, I need to straighten up. I need to do better. I need to, I, need to be, I need to be safe because I can't do these things because the Bible exposes just the wretchedness and wickedness of my own heart. So John here, he says, hey, there's deceivers out in the world, but he says, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, which we have worked, which we have labored for, which we have toiled in rather that you would receive a, fir, a, a full reward. And what's he talking about here? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Keep your finger in the second epistle of John. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 if you can. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the idea of the full reward versus losing what has been wrought is explained to the believer. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And that's what he's talking about when he says that I do. You can keep your finger there. When he says that we receive a full reward and not lose these things. The full reward is the recompense for that labor that is done. It is the recompense for what has been wrought, is the term we have in 2 John. It continues and said, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another built thereupon, a buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Right? This is that idea of looking to yourself. You take heed how you're building upon. You're, you're watching, you're careful of, of yourself and what you're doing and how you are building upon this labor. For other foundation, verse 11, can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, he's always the foundation of everything that we build in the Christian life. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, the foundation of Christ, the salvation that he gave us, the living, the born-again life, the eternal life that resides upon, if you're going to build upon the foundation of salvation that he's given you, any man build upon this foundation Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, all sorts of types. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, what sort it is. And First Peter tells us that trial is quite often the fiery trial of struggles that you face in life. That's where the fire comes. When the, when the flames of trial enter in, that's when what you've built is revealed. That's when what have... what what essentially materials you've placed upon this foundation are staying and which will be removed and burnt up. Verse 14 says, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So the person is saved. The person is still born again. Again, the Corinthian church is being written into in this direct context. The foundation of this believer is a, the foundation of this person is Jesus Christ. Therefore, they are a believer in Christ. Therefore, once saved, always saved. They're on their way to heaven. But the works that they accomplish after that foundation has been laid of Christ in their life shall be tried by fire and they shall either suffer loss or they shall have a purified gold, silver, and precious stones at the end of it all. And this is what's being talked about when it says, you got to remember that it's, yes, God that worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is his works. He is, 
he is the one that hath made these things to be within the believers, so that they are enabled in body to do these works, right? Because the foundation is always Christ. But you need to look to yourselves and not lose those things which you have wrought, but receive the full reward. And the full reward would be at the end of your life. 99.9% .9 of the works that you have done as a Christian believer upon the foundation of Jesus Christ saving your soul would be gold, silver, precious stones. And as the fire of trials enter into your life, all that happens to your reward is it just gets purer and better and shinier and, and just nicer and more enjoyable. Your full reward would be this. Yet the person that has not looked to themselves, who has perhaps been seduced by deceivers, who have, has been tripped up, who has struggled through their lives and relied too much on self, and they have heard truths and yet they've ignored them, and they're not walking in the Christian life as we should, that person is going to lose of those things which they have wrought because their works will be tried up as wood, hay, and stubble according to the context of 1 Corinthians that we see. And back in the second epistle of John, we first need to just rejoice in the fact that glory to God, he both wills in us to work and he also pays us for it. So any works that we have done building upon the foundation of Christ will be paid for it. And that's a wonderful gift that he has given us. He's not just going to make us his slaves and just do all this labor for him. No, he's going to reward us for it richly in the end. So we need to, as Christians, we need to look at self we need to keep guard of our own ways, and we need to continually look to self, keep guard of our own ways. Why? That we lose not those things which we have wrought, but receive the full reward. In the first place where these deceivers are always going to try to get us, remember I said that love, 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 love group, that church that's just all about loving everybody, where's the first place that they start to slip up in? It's in their doctor. Very quickly, when, when love is your focus, you become unbalanced as a believer. And if a whole congregation goes that way, you're all love, 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 love. And you're going to love on anything and anyone and any type and any sort and any whatever that that person would walk in and do. You're going to start to let all sorts of things slide because, well, for the sake of love, we have to be forgiving to X, Y, and Z. Well, for the sake of love, we have to allow X, Y, and Z to enter into our congregation. And so that's why John here is saying, love, 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 love. But he's saying, as ye have heard, you should walk in the truths that I have given. And these truths aren't just contained within grace, mercy, peace, truth, and love, though these should be the primary attitude and action of the Christian. No, he says that there are other truths that have been taught from the beginning. We need to be watchful of those things. The primary target for deceivers is always going to be upon the doctrine of the believer. The primary target for deceivers is always going to be upon the doctrine of the believer. And why is this? Well, look at verse 9. It says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So if you are transgressing or if you are not abiding within the doctrine of God, this verse is clear. It says, He hath not God. You can turn to John chapter 15 if you want to turn to John chapter 15. I'm going to read Psalm chapter 66 which says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And this is the transgression aspect of that verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth against hath not God. So you transgress in the doctrine of Christ is what that verse is explaining. And you hath not God. In other words, you've regarded iniquity in your heart. You're transgressing. Therefore, the Lord hath, does not hear you. And remember that First John chapter uh, 5 ended with the idea that we have confidence that we have the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. But if you're transgressing, then you're not in that same relationship with God whereby he is going to hear your prayers because you've stepped outside of the realm of his blessing that comes when you love him and keep his commandments. John chapter 15 talks about the, uh, the abiding side of, of that statement, the abiding side of that statement. I've got to find it now too. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 in verse 3 says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. 
Abide in me and I in you. Again, he had to command this. So this isn't something that just naturally happens. People think that once we're, once we're saved, we just abide in Christ and just everything that we do is going to be Christ-like. No, he had to command here. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Remember we can grab that same context. Um, from before in 1 Corinthians, that the works that are on Christ are cast forth, the works that are built upon Christ that are wood, hand, stubble, as the branch are cast forth and burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. And remember, back in chapter 8 of, of John, it says, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's the same context that we have here, um, just brought in from what he had just spoken before, a few chapters. As the Father hath, verse 9, loved me, so have I loved you, continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Isn't it interesting here that uh, Jesus Christ is saying that statement, that your joy may be full. That's the whole reason why John, in 1 John, said that he was writing unto the believers, that their joy may be full. So we see that these contexts are coming together, whereby John is talking about that full Christian life, where the where you're abiding in Christ and he's abiding in you and the spirit is giving you power, working his ministry in you, which is to draw you unto all truth and reveal truths that have been spoken to you in Christ. But here you find words very clear in the doctrine idea and the idea of um, Christ um, exhorting them to abide in the doctrine so that they can have God. He says, first, ye, without me, you can do nothing. Verse 5 says, without me, you can do nothing. So if we're to do anything within this ministry, we again have to be built upon that foundation. We need to abide in. We need to continue in. We need to keep the commandments. We need to keep that unity with the Spirit. We need to keep in Christ and within His love that that flow, that living flow of waters can flow through us and unto others. And this is the means and this is the way that our joy is made full. Back in 1, uh, 2 John there. 2 John. So, deceivers want to make you joyless and fruitless Christians. And that's their main goal. Satan knows that he can't take your soul back and send it into hell. He knows that once saved is always saved. And it's sad that many Baptists don't believe that today. Yeah, that's right. But he knows that if he can rob you of your joy which is received by being one with Christ in the Spirit, keeping commandments, walking with God, being in Christ and He in you. If He can rob you of that joy, that fullness of joy, then you will not be glorifying the Father, bringing forth much fruit, as the context we just talked about suggested. So, though you are saved, the enemy today wants you to live like Laodiceans. He wants you to be wretched. He wants you to be miserable. He wants you to be poor and blind and naked spiritually. The devil and the deceiver's goal is to come, and just like it says, he wants you to lose those things which you have wrought. He wants to take the works that you're putting upon the foundation of Christ and make them into wood, hay, and stubble. He'll do this by distracting you. He'll do this by seducing you. He'll do this by giving you other options. It is by convincing you, yea, hath God said, and clouding your mind with untruths. He does this each and every day to believers to the purpose that they would lose what they have wrought and they would become fruitless in their lives. But here, the Apostle John, again in verse 8, he charges, look to yourself. Be focused upon yourself. Be watchful of these things. Don't lose what you have wrought. Receive that full reward. So what does the devil do in order to make you into a Laodicean, and a wretched and poor and miserable and blind and naked spiritual person. Well, he sends his missionaries. If you look down in verse 
10, it says, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So this has always been a major problem, I believe, that the churches which John ministered over, the churches with John led and planted maybe, have always faced, again, because of their their natural tendency and their taught tendency to be full of love for another. The major problem, so much the more that he's going to send this letter unto the elect lady at such a time as this, just this brief letter, and he says, I want you to love, I want you to continue in love, I want you to continue to do these things. But deceivers are entered in. They're going to try to rob you of that full reward. They're going to try to make you transgress and not abide within the doctrine of God so that you don't even have God in your life. You don't have Him on your side. You don't have Him in fellowship working with you. But, he says, he wants you to abide in the doctrine of Christ, that you would have both the Father and the Son, and those, those two come one to another, to the aid of the Christian, and send the Holy Spirit even to help out in these situations. But these false prophets, they come and they bring to you false teachings. They try to cloud the doctrine. They try to mess up your mind and make it evil afflicted towards falsehood and towards lies. So what are we to do in these situations? How are we to defend in these situations? Well, first and foremost, we need to look to ourselves. We need to be self analyzing Christians who are constantly looking in the mirror of God's word, checking ourselves, making sure we are in the faith, making sure we are sound in our walk and sound in our speech. We are sound in our beliefs. We are sound in what the Bible says and just aligning ourselves perfectly conjoined with that, allowing the Holy Spirit to work his work through us and have his truths come out, the truths that he brings us of what Christ hath taught us. The next thing that we need to do is don't receive them. Verse 10 says this, don't receive them into your house. This can be your home. Don't let the Jehovah's Witness come in. Don't let the Mormon come in. Don't let the person that comes and speaks false doctrine unto you. Don't invite them in. I've, I've tried it before. You know, I know a lot of people that have done that thing. I'm going to convince them. No, we don't invite them in. Hey, you can talk to them at the door and maybe try to get the secondary one. I've done this before because they'll travel in packs and one's a newbie and one's a veteran. The veteran is mostly twice dead, plucked out of the roots, the, the, the child of hell. But the other one is brand new, so you might be able to get some gospel truth into that person. But more often than not, it's, it's a lost cause. But either way, do not invite them in. In fact, the best thing you can probably do if you're not willing to get into a spiritual battle with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, then you might as well just say, hey, get out of here. I don't want anything to do with your, your, your cult. I don't want anything to do with your false religion, your, your lies. Get on out of here. And don't invite them in specifically. Don't receive them. The next thing in verse 11, that, that same person that is coming unto you with this doctrine, don't bid them Godspeed, because he that biddeth them Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. In other words, not God bless you, take care, have a great day. I, you know, you are encouraging somebody to do evil and to do wicked. You're, you're, you're building them up, you're pumping them up, you're getting them excited. You say, oh, that was such a nice person, I'm going to go out to the next door. You're encouraging someone in evil matter. And, uh, and, and it should just not be becoming of us, you know. Uh, sometimes take care is what I'll give them because they ought to take care because their next stumble could send them straight to hell when they fall into a street they get injured they die you know, right take care right you know <laughs> whatever but I, I just I just am mindful to just not bless them if they're bringing it to you now if I am bringing it to them and I go to someone else's house someone else's door and they're like oh I'm a Jehovah's Witness I'm like okay I try to give them the gospel they don't want it I'll say well see you later take care you know you're going to them, it's a little bit different. You can be a little bit more polite in those situations because you're on their doorstep. But if they're on your doorstep, because this is the difference. Those person that, that person that's just at their home, they may not even be like evangelizing it. They may just be kind of there because their friends or family go to that, that, that cult or whatever. So you can be a little bit more polite in those situations. But the person that is actively coming and going door to door preaching lies, they're 99% a false prophet, bringing wicked, damnable heresies that are going to send people to hell. It's, it's, it's wicked. Don't invite them in. Don't bid them Godspeed. And that's the charge to Christians in this area. And this is how we guard ourselves from the deceivers that come. We, we analyze. We look to ourselves. We don't receive them. We don't bless them. Right? That happens in our house, in that house, right? It could also be the church, which is in thy house, right? Quite often, the church in these times was in somebody's house. I think the same principle would apply. I think it would also apply here if someone comes here and just starts saying, hey, come to visit the Kingdom Hall. Hey, come visit the Mormon Temple. We say, no, get out of here. We don't want anything to do with this. Get. Yeah. Don't God bless them. Don't, you know, take care. Have a nice day. Hope everything's good, right? No, there's, there's no blessing 
because we don't want to be partakers of their evil deeds. Verse 12 says this, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write unto you with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. There's so much to learn here, obviously, he's saying. He, he, he finishes off by saying, The children of thy elect sister greet thee. So just a note in passing and, and how this kind of connects to my idea with what I think here is that the elder is writing unto a church that quite possibly doesn't have leadership at this time. He says, the children of thy elect sister greet thee, and he's writing from that standpoint that he has elect children within his, uh, the sister, which would be called the church. And he's writing unto this other church, but there is something wanting here. There is something lacking, because in verse 12, he says very clear, I trust to come unto you and speak face to face. Though he still felt the need to care for and to have prayer for and to pen a letter unto this group, it indicates that there is some sort of breach that needs repair. There's some sort of hedge that needs to be made up. There is some sort of wantingness within that ministry that he's writing to. Because um, I believe that the elder wouldn't necessarily need to write to this congregation uh, stay in the love, watch out for deceivers, if they had an elder at that pl place who was able to tell them to love and to watch for deceivers. I think there's something missing from that congregation in his, in his writing. Again, I could be just um, speculating. Uh, the scripture doesn't, isn't clear. Some people, again, I think, think that the elect lady is just a woman and her children. He's just writing to a lady. But when you look at verse 1 and verse 13, you see that there's kind of a gap in there, that the one has the elder and the other one doesn't. He's saying, I'm going to come unto you. I have more to teach you and to preach to you than can be contained in these letters. I believe that there's a breach here. I believe that there's a hedge that needs to be made up. And I believe just as it said in Titus chapter 1 verse 5 that he needs to set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every church. I believe that is kind of the transition that's happening here where people have been saved by the missionaries that have passed through but I think that there is a group of believers, the elect lady being the church and the children being all those who have believed within the church, being part of what is being written to, and they're, they're, they're actually lacking. There's something missing there. And so John here has taken upon himself to give them some leadership, to tell them to continue in the love, to watch for false teachers who try to enter into that house, right? To watch for someone that would come in and try to um, re assume, perhaps, that leadership position and take over and be the deceiver and take that whole church and corrupt it to evil deeds. But... Regardless, he at this time is, is caring for, praying for, and penning to this elect lady and her children. And the purpose is twofold. Continue in the love, but don't let that love soften your heart so much that you're deceived. You need to have a balance in your Christian life.